Hello, uh, my name's Phil Short. I'm a cave explorer and a scientific diving safety officer, and I've been invited to join in with the Big Scuba podcast um, with Gemma and Ian. So we're going to talk about uh, my 30 years history in the diving environments of the world. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the Big Scuba podcast. This is episode 26 coming at you. There we go. <laughs> Uh, right, what's happening? So, this is the Phil Short one. Uh, a lot of people know Phil. Uh, he's a very well-known diver all around the globe, done lots of exciting stuff. Uh, and this was a really, uh, another one of the really good, fun chats that we had. And uh, fascinating. And you know what, sometimes you think, well, actually, I'm looking forward to the next one when we get something back on and you think, right, let's, let's get the update, you know. So, uh, yeah, he, he was, and really, really positive and enthusiastic about diving, um, and that really comes across. So it's a real exciting. Yeah. So, you know, do that. Uh, I hope you really enjoy this episode with Phil. Just before we move on to Phil, just to let me tell you a few heads up. We we'll just uh, also just put something out there as well about uh, our local marine craft uh, store. Um, Ribs yeah, all kayaks. about ribs, kayaks, uh, engines, inflatable kayaks. Uh, look them up, Marine Power, uh, based in Norwich in the UK. And uh, looking at, I, I had an interview with them and looked around some of the ribs. And in a view of, you know, some of the kayaks, that, some of the ribs that they've got, are they big enough to go dive? You know, is there a group of people who can get together, put some money together, and you've got a dive boat? You know, a small dive boat. And yes, you can. There's, they've got one there called the Brig uh, 610. Look it up. Okay, and it's on YouTube. It's out today on the August the 16th. Okay, look it up. Uh, what else? Also, wants to say hello to our friends and partners of the Big Scoop podcast. Uh, Blue and Two, Fourth Element, Mares, SSI, um, you know, Paralens. Um, we've got a some, uh, some things coming out with Paralyns. We have. So, uh, hello to you guys, thank you very much. Can't wait and uh, share that some more with you. Um, what else have we got? I think we've just done our BDMLR course, so we're marine medics now. We are, yeah, how about that? So, we survived the day, it was really good. The weather came out in full UK fashion with thunderstorms. <laughs> rain as hard as it Tropical possibly could. Rain, um, that. Yeah, and we got absolutely soaked. Uh, we did have a mask on, that got washed off when we were in the sea. You know, and it was all good fun. It's all, uh, it's all for a great cause. And, uh, you know, uh, so thank you very much, Joe, uh, for accepting our application and getting us on. Yeah. Um, so, you know, that was really great. So, and also BDMLR, got to get the right words. They were on our podcast, oh, must have been a couple of months ago, quite early on in the lockdown. So if you haven't looked at that episode, give a look and uh, look up Joe Collins. Uh, she was on, talk, all talking about the organisation. It's okay. actually on the YouTube channel. Yeah. A little chat. Uh, yeah. So look at us up on YouTube, A Big Scuba, yeah. and subscribe and hit the bell for notifications. There of might be a resort. subscribe button about there. So get a chance you know do subscribe and uh, keep up to date as Jim's yeah. right. and if you're listening to just the podcast we are recording this outside so it might be a little bit windy yeah so keep it real <laughs> as you do all right but anyway any questions do write in and uh, you know the email address by now the big scuba podcast at gmail.com and you'll find us there okay and uh, we hope you enjoy the show yep yeah, this is episode 26 Phil Short Hi Phil. Hi. Hello. Hi. Yeah, all good. So thank you for joining us, Phil. Yeah. So Phil Short, welcome to the Big Scuba Podcast. Very thank nice you. of you to join us. So myself, Gemma, I'm 
a non-diver, but I'm about to head into my qualification this weekend, fingers crossed, so to do my open water um, with Paddy. So it was all in progress before lockdown happened and then obviously everything ground to a halt. And uh, so I actually did my dry suit orientation last weekend and yeah, this coming weekend, hopefully we'll get the qualification. Where are you going? Uh, Gildenberg for okay. the Saturday okay. and then potentially a shore dive on the Sunday in North Norfolk. Very good, yeah, very so good. Yeah, so quite exciting. So yeah, so sort of getting to know Ian has kind of rubbed off on me and I thought, give it a go. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> Yeah, so that, that's me in terms of scuba diving and I like the water, I live on the coast right by the beach, so yeah, it's, it's a natural thing, hopefully. Cool. Yeah, yeah so that's me. Okay, um, and myself, I've been diving for about five years and uh, dive master for about three, four years of that. Uh, really enjoy the role, um, really ha uh, enjoy helping people get started and uh, talking about diving and just having fun and things like that. I've uh, got two children, Harvey and Honey, and uh, slowly getting them into the sport as well, uh, where we can. Um, and that's sort of generally me, really. I'm a bit like Gemma, you know, um, love being by the sea, uh, kayaking, uh, snorkeling, and all those sort of things. When, you know, when we couldn't do the diving, we, we were on the river doing some snorkeling before uh, we could do anything. So um, that's kind of generally me, really. Um, dive master and helping people get started, really. So Good. that's me. That's Good. Yeah. Tell us about you, Phil. Uh, well, I started as a dry caver. So, so by basically right. beginnings was dry caving. From dry caving, I found that following cave passages, I'd end up in a place where there was a big hole. So I learned how to use ropes to repel. And then other places where there was a vertical wall, so I learned to climb. And then eventually, if you follow caves far enough, there's water. Um, mm -hmm. So you start by wading, sometimes swimming, sometimes you take inflatable boats and travel in the rivers underground on those and eventually the water hits the ceiling and the way on is cave diving so um, my the only reason really I ever learned to dive which started with Paddy open water much like Gemma's about to do um, was I approached the cave diving community from my position in the caving community and said I want to cave dive they said well the best thing you can do is go away and learn to dive just the basics clear the mask buoyancy swap regulators and then come back and join the British cave diving group and they'll teach you not so much to dive but how to cave underwater and as they say the rest is history that was 30 years ago and kind of here I am now <laughs> yeah so you in the group there with um, Michael Thomas and uh, Robert well Robert's, on a few weeks ago. Robert's my godson oh, all right cool so it's a very small world. <laughs> it is. Yeah, Mike was my regular cave diving buddy for about six years. And uh, so we, we had numerous adventures all over Europe and uh, North America and definitely the UK. And then when, uh, when Robert was born, I was friends with uh, Mike and Robert's mum, Sarah. And so they asked me to be the godfather. And uh, funnily enough, he's 20 now and it's uh, it literally over lockdown was the first opportunity I've had to dive with him. So we've done quite a lot of diving together on rebreather in open water and on, on side mount in cave over the last few weeks. Um, it's the first chance we've had since, since he was born. So that's been pretty All right. cool. Whereabouts are you based in the UK? Well, I live at the moment in Devizes in Wiltshire, but mm -hmm. obviously I don't do any work from there. Um, my uh, position in the industry, if you like, has evolved dramatically over the 30 years. The first 10, I was teaching Paddy. I started as a dive master, um, as with Ian, uh, and then rapidly, within 12 months of doing dive master, the centre I worked for asked me to do my IEC, become an instructor. Um, they said, we can't, can't pay for it, but if you do it, we've got a job for you. So I did that. So then I worked for eight years in Poole and Swanage alternating season by season between divers down on Swanage Pier and diving leisure as it was then in pool, um, slowly building my teaching qualifications till eventually I got up to master instructor and also building my personal technical diving experience and qualifications trained by Kevin Gurr and also building my cave diving experience through the cave diving group, uh, starting to dive more and more adventurous British flooded sections or sumps as they're known, getting involved in some European cave diving group expeditions. Mm -hmm. And then slowly the whole thing just started to kind of glue together. I got really, once I got to master instructor, I was faced with a career choice. I could either leave Paddy and go down the tech route with Kevin or go the whole hog and go from master instructor to course director with Paddy. And I think uh, my timing was perfect. I chose the tech route just when course director was getting more and more popular. There were more and more people doing it. Mm. Um, 
and tech was just booming and growing. So I chose to go down the tech path with Dave Thompson, Kev Gurr, um, ended up working for their company, stayed with Kevin when Dave and Kev went a separate ways company wise yeah. um, and, and basically worked my way up through till I was teaching mostly Rebreather. Um, and then opportunity arose to teach Rebreather to some scientific institutions. And as a result of that, they invited me to come back as, as a, basically a, a team manager for their scientific projects, which grew into dive safety officer. And that's what I do now, have done for like the last seven years. All right. So what sort of things, you, when you say scientific project, what, what can you, are there things you can tell us about? What sort of things? Oh, yeah, yeah. It's all public, it's all public domain because I, I work as dive safety officer and dive operations manager for um, universities mainly, but also for the United States National Park Service, for Woods Hole Oceanographic Institute, WUI, the institute in Boston, Massachusetts, that found Titanic, found the black smokers, found the white smokers, found the missing hydrogen bomb that the Americans carelessly lost. Um, so I heard I, about that, yeah. Yeah, I work as the supervisor on mo basically almost exclusively archaeological projects. So in the last seven years, I've worked a number of years on the Antikythera Mechanism shipwreck as supervisor, on the Mentor shipwreck, which was uh, Lord Elgin's ship carrying the Parthenon marbles um, mm. from the Acropolis of Athens back to the British Museum and uh -huh. sunk. Our, we, one of our most rewarding jobs, we worked on a US B-17 uh, bomber off of uh, the island of Biz in Croatia to recover the pilot and so he could be taken back and buried by his family for closure, um, uh, which was a really good project because mm. we had to effectively disassemble the wreck, sift through all the remains in the seabed, find uh, the crew remains, then put the wreck back together uh, and basically come away from that project. Which and then the only one left? Uh, there were three missing. So when, they, when the plane ditched, three didn't make it. Um, there's eyewitness reports from those that did make it that uh, at least one was thrown clear of the wreckage on impact. So we were looking for two. Uh, we found extensive osseous or bone remains. Um, but what happens then is they are um, secure, shipped out to the DPAA's uh, laboratories in Hawaii, and they do uh, DNA testing on the bone remains. And what happened was all the bone remains we found were one person, oh, Lieutenant yeah. Eugene B. Ford, who was the pilot. So he went back to his family. He had a full Arlington military um, ceremony and then was buried by his family in his home cemetery. So uh, um, it's what they consider as closure. Um, yeah. Archaeology, you, you dig down, excavate down centimetre by centimetre. Uh, once you're a given uh, distance beneath the last find, you're in what's called sterile ground and then you close the site. So mm. we, we acquired sterile ground of the entire area um, with no more fines. So they said, well, obviously the two missing were thrown clear of the wreck either on impact or during sinking. And we got lucky with finding the pilot, but we found his wedding ring, his flight wings, um, wow. most of the suit, his ear earphones. That's good uh, that the family got them back. Exactly. That's uh, the DPAA, which is the um, Defence POW MII Accounting Agency. Uh, they've got in, in excess of 5,000 sites worldwide from wars going back to the First World War, right through to Vietnam, Korea. And their job is to, is to do exactly that, leave no man behind. So whether it be in the jungles, in the mountains, in the Arctic, or underwater, they, their task is to slowly work down this list of site, aircraft crash sites where people didn't come home. Um, uh, we, we did one in 2017, that was the B-24 Witchcraft, uh, sorry, beg your pardon, that's the one we flew in, B-24 Tulsa American, uh, and then uh, we were due back, we were due back this year, but due to COVID, it's likely now to be next year, um, for a similar job on a B-17, uh, which is a bit deeper, so that's, that's pretty re rewarding work. Yeah, and then how the late is that? Uh, 70, uh, the Tulsa, Tulsa American was 40, and the, the B-17 is at 70. Um, the B-17 doesn't even have a name, it was so new, it was delivered to the air crew um, to Italy, flown on its first mission, flak damaged and ditched in the sea on the way back. So the crew hadn't even had time to give her a name and paint some nose art on her. Oh, okay. Her first it must, mission. Yeah, it must be really great. Obviously, you're learning all the history behind it as well as mm. obviously doing the job of recovery. Yeah, absolutely. I find, um, you know, as well as being supervisor and trainer for the team, um, and then a, a commercial working diver on the projects, all the heavy work is done by us rather than scientists. I got really interested in the archaeological side of things as well, both with Antikythera was 200 BC. Um, so 
we, we recovered human remains from that, including a, an intact skull, uh, and were able to extract DNA from it. This is like 2,200 years old. So I started uh, training with NAS, did all my NAS qualifications, and slowly started working up through the projects and courses, gaining the NAS credit. So basically, mainly I could supervise from a viewpoint of understanding what they were trying to achieve yeah incredible yeah, yeah. Is. <laughs> you just start with cave diving and then it just leads to yeah an amazing yeah yeah, but the, the cave diving has always remained a passion. That's that's basically, you know, if I get a day off, you'll find me in a hole in the ground, not not in sea. Um, <laughs> but I tend to work in the sea a lot for my job. Yeah, yeah. So what have you been doing sort of through lockdown? Have you had projects to work on outside of obviously not getting in the water? Well, uh, basically what I've done is I've basically got a really good head start on writing the risk assessments and project plans for our next series of projects. So normally they're done leading up to and then even during during a project whereas here I've been able to get a lot of risk assessment and project plans written out ready for the next three in advance building and testing equipment we need for those jobs so when you excavate on these aircraft you use what's called a water dredge which is a more controlled version of, a, of an airlift powered by water jet not by uh, air bubbles so we've been designing and building one specifically for this next job because it's deep and um, so we've been able to do that on a personal level, I've really the first two months of lockdown where I simply couldn't get in the water at all, I really flew, threw myself into my drones because I've got a commercial drone license. Uh, do that for the projects to get aerial footage of the work sites, etc. So I renewed that commercial license, did some specialty training, and got hundreds of flight hours um, to sort of. Uh, grow my skill set um, which was fun you know it's something different um, learnt photogrammetry which was great fun um, wasn't able to get underwater footage so was using the drone footage to then make 3D models um, I, I live um, on the Kennet Navan Canal so I was making 3D models of the the Cane Hill locks um, which was good so new new skills that add to my company add to the, the, the various bits and bobs we do for the projects through the institutions. And then finally was able to slowly start get back in the water. I, I was one of the, uh, I'm one of the members of the British Diving Safety Group. So I was involved in all the meetings that slowly work towards approval for people to go back to diving. And I think we announced the, uh, the, the uh, acceptable to go back to shore diving within family groups on a Wednesday. And at 4 a.m. the next morning, I drove to Chesil Beach and, uh, <laughs> did a did a really straightforward shore dive on the the United States um, tank landing craft um, in a pair of doubles, not even a rebreather, just uh, on my own, and it was absolutely fabulous just to be back in the water. <laughs> and since then, I've managed to get wet a couple of times a week um, in some caves in the sea, um, in in the quarries to get get hours back on the rebreather and get rebreather current ready for when the projects start again. So yeah, yeah. kept sane. And uh, to be honest, uh, after the last uh, well, the last 10 years have been pretty hectic with a massive amount of dive hours and numbers of dives. So I actually feel pretty well rested after the three months. I think it did me some good. Yeah. 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 I That's think good, a lot of people have benefited from the lockdown in, you know, different ways that they never thought possible. Yeah. 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 So what sort of drone you got? Uh, I've got a Phantom 4 um, uh, V2, the DJI one. I started with a Phantom 3 and upgraded to a Phantom 4, mainly because it's a bit more stable. Um, the communication is more stable because it's wired from the, the viewing screen to the handset, whereas the, the 3 was uh, Wi-Fi, so some connectivity issues. But most importantly, the 4's got a much higher quality camera. Um, so I keep, I've still got the 3, so when I'm doing jobs where there's a, a reasonable chance I might have a, an incident, like especially working from boats. I tend to take the free, but they're all insured. Not cheap, uh, the, 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 um, the better the camera, the more expensive they are. So I also um, do some work alongside another drone pilot, and he has an Inspire, which is the, the big drone, and you fly it together. So one of you flies the bird, and the other one actually controls the camera. So there's two sets of remote. So when I work with him, I fly the fly the fly the, the aircraft, and he controls the camera and shoots, which is quite nice. But yeah, yeah that's a completely different budgetary bracket. So with your um, scuba diving, did you? get inspired by anybody to start it or was it just literally because you were a caver that thought you had well, to add that one the um the the inspiration for cave diving came i was working at the time i lived in surrey i was working at a camp camping and outdoor shop in guilford um, and nearby was guilford university i wasn't at the university it was just nearby so i was able to use their climbing wall um in the evening so i'd cycle cycle into work work in the climbing and camping shop cycle over to the climbing wall climb in the evenings um and then basically cycle home and 
and then go go out climbing and caving and other sorts of adventuring at the weekends. And at the climbing wall one day, there was a little note on the, the notice board saying that there was a talk by um, a guy called Martin Farr uh, about cave diving. And I was like, right, we're going to see that. So me and my came climbing buddy went to see this talk and um, at the end of the talk Martin was selling his book which was the first edition of the Dark and Spec so the talk was like amazing and then we bought the book and went home and read it end to end and then started going to a lot of the caves that were mentioned in the book but at that point not diving um, and it was I think one of my real sort of bucket list proudest parts of my, my career as it were is I first edition was definitely a massive part of inspiring me to be a cave diver and then I was actually in the last edition that was released last year uh, for one of my projects. So it was like full circle. It was like that book got me going. And I ended up in that book in its third edition um, in, by sort of 2019. So that was kind of a bit of a journey and a bit of a story. So that was... Yeah, no, that's really, yeah, something to shout out about. Yeah, he's a great guy though. I mean, he's a personal friend rather than just someone who, who I know because he's famous. He's a really good guy extremely driven explorer um and, and has just basically sort of led the way for a lot of us yeah, and it seems quite a tight-knit community the diving world <laughs> it, it depends the more specialists you get the tighter it gets so diving is quite a tight-knit community tech diving is tighter if you then go sideways from tech diving into tech cave diving it's even tighter and if you then get into the really tiny world of, of british sump dive which is basically driven by the british cave diving group then it's really you know there's like literally a handful of of proponents that are actually actively doing it over the years so yeah you te everyone tends to know everyone um and generally you know there's always exceptions to the rule generally it's the camaraderie is excellent the friendship and the you know the team teamness if you if you need to go on a project and you need 20 regulators there's a good chance after two or three phone calls they can they can be pulled together from different people that will loan them for the project or manufacturers will say, yeah we'll loan you when you bring them back send them back whatever condition they're in so it, it's uh, it's quite a nice community mm -hmm. yeah. it's good for manufacturers as well because then they can t um, they're continually testing their equipment yeah well we do have a, a bit of a reputation british cave divers or what you could call northern european cave divers and our best the best way to separate technical cave diving which you'd find in the yucatan of mexico uh, florida um, central france like the midi pyrenees some of which is absolutely you know unbelievable distances and depths way in excess of what a, a british sump dive would do but it is diving so you're uh, technical diving in a flooded underwater environment. What sump diving is, what the British cave diving group and equivalent specialize in is caving underwater. So the idea is lots of dry caving. The dive is an obstacle. Diving equipment as necessary is used to pass that obstacle. And that may well be rebreather, DPV, dry suit, heated suit systems, but it could be as simple as a couple of three liter cylinders tucked mm -hmm. under the arm in a wetsuit and a pair of rubber wellingtons but the objective with either is to get through that flooded section drop that gear and go caving again so it's, yeah. it's a means of passing obstacles rather than a means to an end mm. so yeah. with your caving have you traveled all around the world if, is it taking you quite extensively to different places very much very much so i mean uh, basically i've been lucky enough to explore so actually to lay line and go to places where no human being has been before in spain uh, in France, in Russia, um, in the UK, um, on the Balearic Islands, um, in the US, um, and in Mexico. Mm. Um, and, and then cave dive on, on already laid line in numerous other countries. But um, the, the, the drive, why a purist cave diver, why we do it is for that chance to be able to, you know, explore in the truest sense of the word. No aircraft, no satellite, no camera can go there before you. No. You get to, yeah you get to the end of the last laid line tie on your own line and swim ahead into the darkness that it's exp exploration like it was for shackleton scott amundsen hillary you know pre-technology it's it's uh, true exploration so and it's a privilege and a and a drive it's definitely why we do it yeah it must be exciting to go to these places where no one's actually ever been to before and mm. it's all you're breaking new ground it must be it's really exciting very exciting uh, but it's also a very it's humbling and a big privilege yeah. and uh, one of my one of my exploratory mentors who I was lucky enough to go on expedition with in 2013 for three months uh, Bill Stone he told me right at the beginning when I first met him if you go and dive in a cave or anywhere else and you come back and say I dived it here's a here's a photo that is not exploration to call it exploration you have to go find it document it 
survey it and bring back the data. So in cave exploration, that will be the highest grade map you're capable of producing so that the map can be added to the already existing map of the dry cave overlaid on the surface map of the region and you start to get an understanding for the hydrogeology of the region where the water's going where it's likely to come out because this yeah. can be useful for communities for basically fresh water availability for agriculture or just for drinking and washing um, you're also bringing back data of any life forms or water samples and sediment samples in some cases cave archaeology um, you know skeletal remains from burial sites when water levels were different from entrance mm -hmm. areas of caves. so you're, you really are participating in speleology whether it's uh, a map a survey a sample biological uh, geographical hydrogeological ge geographical you're, you're bringing back data and that's that really i think for me is uh, where you get the defining point between a highly adventurous caving or diving trip and a genuine expedition a genuine expedition achieving genuine exploration is going for a scientific purpose it will bring back data what it found um, that can go into the the, uh, the annals of such data held within institutions like the Royal Geographic Society, the Explorers Club, etc. Mm. Uh, because when the next generation come right, I want to continue that exploration. Where do I start? They can go to these institutions, read up on what's been done, and have enough information to go further, rather than just uh, you know I don't know a picture saying we went here, we got deeper than the last person. What did you yeah. find? What direction does it go in? What's the compass bear? What's the nature of the rock? What's the size of the passage? So the next team can plan, and that's how we plan our expeditions. We base it on the research of the last people to go there um, and build up our project plan from there. And I suppose some of these caves they probably have the research and the work that was carried out might have been years ago when it was all down with handwritten notes and drawings and things like that now we've got how modern technology is coming more in use Christina Sonato uh, who we've had on a couple of times uh, was telling us about the Nemo system yeah. that they use yeah. Yeah. How, and how that integrates with Google earth yes. and you can yes. see like for a building when they look at the building regulations now right. you can say right you know that's right on top of a cave and that's not a good idea and that's Absolutely. brilliant that me modern technology you can use and that's going to help and uh you guys your mm. your do your job yeah yeah absolutely you know back in back in the day you, you'd survey with a tape measure a pencil and a, and a notepad <laughs> uh, and now dry cave we use a laser so you just have one guy at the last point next guy goes as far ahead as he can go and still be in line of sight and just bounce the laser off his plaque and basically it automatically records the data and you can then download that to a, a a pad while you're underground effectively the the survey is being drawn while you're exploring so and the, the sky's the limit if you, look, if you look at what stone's been doing with three-dimensional autonomous mapping with things like sunfish in the caves of Namibia. This is basically what looks, if you see it, looks like a small DPV, but it doesn't take a diver. It has no umbilical. It's an AUV, an autonomous underwater vehicle. And it's so clever, you drop it in the cave um, and it's basically um, then able to just swim into the cave, three dimensionally mapping everything that it sees. And it's so clever, it can then say, right, time to come home because I'm reaching reserve on battery. And it turns around and follows its own map home out of a, you know, I mean, Google it, it's called Sunfish. The test, test dives were done in uh, Peacock Springs in North Florida, monitored by cave divers just in case. Surely you don't want too much of that going on though, do you? Well, yes, because if you look, um, the legend that wrote most of the rules we follow for cave diving was Sheck Exler, cave diver number one. Um, and he sadly passed trying to explore uh, the far reaches of a very, very deep um, sinkhole cave in Mexico and what Bill was able to do with an earlier iteration of sunfish was go back and complete that job autonomously in sub 300 meters of depth so we're, we're getting to the point where with things like um, Paranis Abyss in Czech Republic explored by Christoph Staranowski um, and other sites like this we're getting to the point where we're beyond human capability uh, similar to the deepest parts on the ocean free swimming diver at this time can't go there you yeah. can't take that human but it doesn't mean you can't still explore mm -hmm. and then the goal of what Bill is creating with this sun is it's a test bed. Caves are a test bed. Building a nuclear powered autonomous vehicle to swim around in the ocean under the ice cap on Europa, Jupiter's moon, to look for microbial life. Yeah. So the, the link between uh, what cave explorers are doing, what, you know. But why not our, our own planet? 
Well, um, it's being done as well. So, I mean, the, 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 the daft thing is, if you look at the technology um, to keep out the pressure of seven miles of water depth, versus the technology to keep out a vacuum. It's easy. easier to make something <laughs> survive in space than it is to make something that can survive at seven miles depth in the Mariana Trench. Crazy, so isn't all, it? All this. Yeah, well, it's true. Yeah. Yeah. I, won't, I won't get... I won't like, get we, you know, when we're talking to like, the guys at the Galapagos and they talk about the uh, the whale sharks and how they don't know where they go. And, you think, and that's, yeah. some of that is because of the, the whale, whale shark, but also because of the oceans. Are just not that explored Absolutely. and you think yeah. wow you could use something like that and find out more about where the, the whale sharks are going yeah. explore more of the ocean but then part of me also thinks don't we still want to have places on earth where we don't know yeah absolutely you that know we've lost still got these mysteries <laughs> yeah it'd be brilliant like, like you know like um like uh, conan doyle's lost world not find some imagine some sort of isolated peak in the middle of the jungle of the amazon that nobody's been to with we've, we've still got dinosaurs on top of it something like that it's, <laughs> yeah it's a schoolboy dream i mean but it, but you've just summed up why we do this why do why does a, a you know a normal guy decide i'm going to spend my life going down underwater going in a cave going up because you want to know what's around that next corner it's the unknown yeah. um so, so for some people in the general public the general populace the unknown equals fear um for others the unknown equals excitement for you know for cave explorers for, for ocean explorers, for, for mountain climbers, these are people that are excited by it. What is it? Where is it? Can I go and have a look at this? Mm. And it's history making. <laughs> yeah. yeah, absolutely. But you, yeah. you've changed things though, because the, we've had, you know, various guests, and I, I'm not going to name names, yeah. but we've had various guests who are either wreck divers or yeah. cave divers, and they never seem to like bridge the two. They either go down one route or yeah. the other. You yeah. seem as so though you get you know you get excited by the boat you yeah. whether it's on and yeah. diving onto a b that's where i'd be i'd be on the b17 yeah. that that interests me a lot i've been uh I've got a lot of hit you know right i get do get right excited about history especially world war ii stuff. uh i find it totally fascinating and the but you're also getting interested into the wreck site the uh sorry the caves dive and stuff you know so it's good that you you know you're bridging the two yeah yeah it was an accident really i mean it, it, like i say i was a caver and um basically linked into caving was climbing and, and mountain walking because a lot of the caves are on top of a mountain and a, mm -hmm. a lot of caves have vertical sections up or down so those three sports kind of linked together and that was me and then when the british cave diving group said yep yeah, uh, no problem but we need you to go and do a basic diving course before we can start and i just back then there wasn't much internet so i went to smith's and i bought a copy of diver magazine and i went to the classifieds back and went right dorset is the nearest to me i lived in surrey found the dive center rung them up said yeah i'd like to learn to dive they said yep yeah, we can do that we've got another guy interested um we, so we can run a course and it was february 1990 so we went down we did the pool sessions the sea was too rough, so we drove up to Stony Cove for the four open water dives, and I ended up qualified. And I was like, but I really like that too. That was fun. <laughs> uh, and so then they, they literally both grew together. So the, the, you know, the passion in the wrecks and the sea and the marine life and the passion in the caves and the exploration, they grew sort of hand in hand. And they complemented each other because I learned yeah. to try mix in the open water. I was then able to use the trimix skills in K, et cetera, et cetera. So yeah, it, it worked well. Yeah. So for kind of someone like me, a non-diver, what advice would you give to someone just maybe considering stepping into the scuba world? Mm, well, I tend to give a piece of advice that was given to me by my mentor. My my first instructor uh, was a guy who's not teaching or diving anymore. It's a guy called Steve Axtell. Uh, and he was an absolute legend. If you talk around the paddy community with instructors that were trained or course direct like trained from the sort of uh, the 90s and the early 2000s, he, were, he was one of the iconic paddy educators. Absolutely brilliant. And when I started um, during my open water course, which you're currently Currently doing he said to me the secret is on every dive practice one skill and choose the ones you don't like and you're no good at because then they'll become easy and when they're easy start practicing another one that you don't like and you're not good at and if you yeah. make the effort at some point during every dive to stop looking at the fish stop looking at the wreck and um, sacrifice to the gods of diving improvement five minutes of each dive to practice a skill you will get better and 7,000 dives later, I've stuck to his advice, and that is how I've improved, is by mm. continually 
accuracy. So that I really couldn't beat that advice that he gave to me. It's good advice. Yeah. And I just share it and pass it on to, because I'm only able to teach people because he taught me. So, you know, it seems full circle to help pass his great advice on to the people that I'm now. Making. Yeah, no, that's good. And do you still teach or is it not something you do anymore? Yeah, I teach, um, but really uh, it would be wrong to say I teach what I want to teach. I teach the really kind of high level specialist stuff. So the last four years I've done um, a five or six week period each year in the mines of Scandinavia, teaching the advanced levels. So Trimix Rebreather in mine, DPV in mine, um, cartography and mapping for mine diving. Uh, the same thing, I do a six to eight week period per year in France, doing the same for cave. So advanced cave, like mapping, DPV use, multi-stage, diving beyond flooded sections and caving mm-hmm. beyond. Um, and then in the ocean, the higher levels, so the the, the highest level of rebreather, the hypoxic trimix. Um, I've, I've not taught open circuit for many years. Um, it's been exclusively rebreather for certainly the last five, realistically the last 10. And now with teaching most Mostly like 90% in mine or cave uh, with the occasional ocean based course, but at the higher. Um, and the main reason for that is as an instructor trainer, I've trained a lot of the UK instructors, uh, certainly those that work within my agency, I into the UK. So it's their turn. It's like, you know, I'm, I'm teaching the high levels. They, they, uh, they teach people up to a certain point. People say, well, what do I do next? I want to do this. Can you teach it? And they go, well, no, but the guy who taught me can do that. And slowly this moves. Yeah. So one year I might be able to teach a uh, normoxic trimix rebreather to a guy, but slowly his instructor, I move him up the ladder as he gets experienced and gets the hours and gets the knowledge. Um, and, and basically there's no need for me to teach the beginners. I've, I've taught people to do that. Mm. And it's the, it's their turn. Diversity is good. So, yeah. Yeah. so what um, rebreather do you use? Uh, at the moment, I'm, I basically I've tried to run a procedure over my career. And realistically, it's been 15 years where I've been more or less exclusively on rebreathers but in that 15 years I've, I've tried to be fairly strict with a no more than two rebreather policy because i don't feel and this is very much because i know you're recording this and you use it very much a personal thing for me mm. i don't feel i can remain um, knowledgeable and current to do my very best job at teaching five six seven rebreathers because they're all unique yeah. so i've tried to stay within within two systems and when i say systems there there are for example several rebreathers which consist of breathing bags breathing hoses and a mouthpiece that's all the same more or less what changes is the control system so it's a bit like saying do do you use a mac do you use a pc it's hard to be really good at using both so i've tried to always limit myself to two control systems and obviously the the control system that has over the last five years for want of a better phrase, taken over the rebreather world is Shearwater. So yeah. my main main platform at the moment, which was driven by demand, all the course inquiries I get at those higher levels and all my scientific project teams are using JJ. So uh, certainly in the last two years, I've pretty much been exclusively on the JJ. Mm. Right, okay. Uh, yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, and you'd like you say, you can't, you know, be a master of everything, can you? You've just got to, yeah, yeah concentrate. I'm a, I'm, a cave, I'm a cave diver. I drag my knuckles along the floor and I haven't got a big enough brain to learn two things at once. <laughs> <laughs> Have you seen an increase in women coming into your kind of level of diving in the last 10 years? Or what's your view Um, on it? An increase, yes, but not a big enough increase because Mm -hmm. basically in, um, in technical cave diving, so back to what we were talking about earlier, where there's a difference between technical diving in a cave where you are predominantly always underwater, but that time underwater might be two, three kilometers of distance. It might be... 100 meters of depth it might be four or five hours of time but you are underwater the whole versus um, a, a dry caving trip where you have to take equipment a very long distance dry to get it to where you can dive in the example of the j2 project 12 kilometers horizontally over one kilometer vertically on rope carry, carrying all the gear over many many months so um they you know there there is in the technical diving community the there is absolutely no division um some of the best technical diving cave divers that i've dived with um are women um uh, as equally some are men there's there's no divide whatsoever mm. you look at the likes of christina 
of Jill. Um, these people are, you know, world class leading yeah. the way, not following. Um, mm-hmm. It's irrelevant, um, you know. And and it's a it, when there tends to be a greater proportion of um, male cave cave divers. Um, now, why that is, I don't know. Um, the physical strength side is necessary, so to carry gear twelve kilometres crawling on your face, abseiling down ropes. It requires a certain degree of stamina, uh, fitness, and insanity. Fact. <laughs> um, but there are extremely gifted female uh, dry cave practitioners that are doing that. Uh, a US girl called Gilly Ellor was on the, tw- the uh, 2013 J2 project as a support caver, and she's gone on to learn rebreather and is now using that to do similar projects in her own right. So I don't really see a division be honest Uh, you know much like in athletics the divide between the male times and female times has shrunk and shrunk and shrunk Um, I think it's basically exactly the same so there has been a rise to answer your question but I personally don't think it's a big enough rise there should be far more um, women out there getting involved in doing this whether that's because they don't want to or whether it's not because they're not given opportunities I don't know as a community we can certainly do something about B um, Mm. by by taking away the stigma no, it's not elitist. It's it's available for anyone who wants to put the effort in. Yeah. yeah. Well, having spoken to Jill and Christina, it's just you know inspiring how they've kind of moved right through and progressed. Yeah. yeah. And Absolutely. they and they're still progressing as well, aren't they? There's just kind of it's, it's limitless, really. Where they. Yeah. yeah. Go. So have you seen like uh, on some of these dives that you've done? Uh, so and then I'm thinking about some of the the remote dive you've done, carried out like with the B17, maybe some of the caves, but probably uh, the wreck one are you seeing more evidence of man you know so plastic waste and litter and things like are you seeing evidence of that creeping into some of these remote places absolutely yeah everywhere the only exception is the only place we see pristine nature um uh, as it was before we ruined it is is deep in these remote caves so like the J2 cave as an example um, firstly the entrance to the cave is on top of the mountain in in secondary rainforest the mountain is in a very remote part of southern Mexico on the Guatemala border so the only thing around the base of the mountain is is ra- peasant ranches so you're like a day by dirt track before you even get to the ranch you're then a day by foot and donkey to get to the top of the mountain where base camp is um, and then you're then four days from the entrance of the cave to the dive site underground right. um, when you get to a place like that there are no footprints there is no dirt there's no plastic there's nothing it is literally unspoilt by man in the ocean i've been to some very remote places um truck lagoon very lucky to go there other places within the Pacific um, and you know it, it's everywhere which I suppose is inevitable because the sea moves mm-hmm. and when you look at you know uh, articles and footage from scientific based institutions not like trash magazines or trash TV you know we've got floating a- float- floating oceans uh, of plastic just out in the middle of the Pacific these areas like you know a kilometre across of, of floating plastic trash just in the middle of the ocean so, so yeah. it, it is everywhere we, we can't erase that it's happened and it's there. What we need to do is move forward and deal yeah, with it. And, yeah. you, know, you can't pretend it doesn't exist. It does. Um, we've just got to collectively as a species stop and then clean up the mess we've already made. It's quite a big responsibility when you think about it, that you, when you go to these places that you're talking about with J2 and you go to these extreme places where it takes you days just to get to the dive site, that when you leave there, you're thinking, right, have we got everything? Yeah. You know yeah. how you take you, you, it's quite a big responsibility to make sure you've got everything with you that you've let that you took there it is right like down to wrappers and food thing everything absolutely everything is bought out and that's the last phase i mean j2 was three months long um i personally spent 45 days underground there were 50 50 plus people from 15 countries involved in the project through the three months big um, operation. And they, yeah, the, the, if you like, the glory bit was basically nine days long and it was smack in the middle. The first month was setting it up. Uh, the last month was bringing everything out. The only thing that was left in the cave pending future returns to continue exploration was the lead weights. Mm. That's They were left by the water side for any other future team that wants to go and continue the diving with a with a Do new not leave a note. Sorry? <laughs> Do you not leave a note? We were no. here first. <laughs> no, no, well, you know, with we, a photo going back to data. We've we've got the data. We've got video. We've got stills. We've got a, a grade five C uh, cartographic map of uh, of where we went to, but we didn't carry the lead out. Other than that, 
wrappers, food waste, everything brought out of yeah. the cave, like, yeah. which is a lot of work. But you do, yeah, you do have that. Some of the some of the caves. This particular cave is a, a river cave, so in the wet season it floods and then clears itself through. But some of the caves that have no water flow ever, places like a very famous long distance beautiful cave in uh, the americas called lechuguilla um, there they're hermetically sealed there's an airlock to get in and then you've got tens of kilometers to get to the far reaches of the cave and in those circumstances even the human waste is brought out peas in bottles um solid waste is in bags and all that's brought out as well to stop any bacterial yeah. but mm. somewhere like day two it floods in the winter so basically if you pee in the winter when the whole cave floods it's out to what do the exit but everything yeah. we used to take a lot of planning yeah Gemma's now seeing all this because um you know we went diving at the weekend and she saw all the gear that i had you know mm. you, you need the truck you, you put all this gear in the boxes and that's just for a day that's just for a couple just for a couple swims you know and i can't imagine the amount of gear that you need to go away for three months somewhere remote the food and everything for 50 people yeah well we we, we, we literally on j2 we spent uh like i said three months in in the field 45 days of which for me personally were underground uh 50 plus people and of that time, uh, me and one other diver were able to pass the terminal flooded section and find new K um, uh, once. So that the, you know, you basically, what you went for was one day of those three months. Um, and it's, it's interesting, welcome to the sport, Gemma, because um, it's one of the worst sports I've ever come across for um, return. So um, there's this lovely joke where um, one one member of a, a of a of a partnership says, "Oh, I'm going off diving. I'll see you this evening." And the other member of the partnership goes, "Okay, have a nice day." And you go off. And nine hours later, you come back and they say, "What did you do?" I said, "Well, I did like a 30 minute dive on a wreck in the morning, and I did a 35 minute dive um, on the reef in the afternoon." Well, why were you gone nine hours? You know, what else? <laughs> And it does. And if you get more technical, it gets worse because for 20 minutes on a 60 meter wreck on open circuit, you'll end up spending 40 minutes decompressing. So a 60 minute dive is 40 minutes of doing nothing yeah. for 20 minutes of doing something. And to get there is three hours on a boat. To get back is three hours on a boat. Plus all the preparation, cylinder filling, analyzing, labeling, blah, blah, blah. So the return is off, but we love it. And that's why we Exactly. Yeah. yeah. And are you still keeping the logbook? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I'm on uh, oh, volume, well done, 20, volume 28, all paper logbooks. It's more of a journal now. So I've got sketches, hand drawn maps, even some little watercolors of things that I've seen. Um, I photocopy uh, more more detailed maps from sources and stick those into the map into the books folded but they all sit on a bookshelf all 28 volumes that's yeah, amazing I also got mine I've logged I'm not up to 28 book. though I think I'm up to about five I think <laughs> well you know I was up to five at one point but I've not I've logged every single dive since that first open water paddy dive in Stony Cove not yeah missing. that's good to hear though because we've had people on who have who stopped and now and then regretted it because you know years have gone on and they haven't kept kept those records and you know they'd like to go back to that time and, yeah, uh, yeah of, i think that's nice a lot of colleagues like that um and i think if i'd ever have stopped and there were times like you know in my first eight years when i was teaching on swanage pier i might do eight dives a day but six of them would be 20 minute Swanage pier dives for a discover scuba diving. So they're real yeah. dives, you know, they're in the sea, they're, you know, in, they're 20 minutes long. But I started logging those as just single lines. And I think if I'd given up then, because I was like, oh, really? Do I need to log this? It's just another Swanage pier dive. If I'd given up then, I probably would never have restarted. So I'm yeah. really pleased that I just, but people joke with me, you know, uh, some people have OCD. My friends tell me I have CDO because OCD wasn't in alphabetical order. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's, it's unfortunately it's not far from the truth so you know logging, i've not heard of that i like that cdo logging works for me i just like you know it's part of my day i finish my dive i sit down depending on what's going on i have a cup of tea or a beer and i get the logbook out and the pen i think gemma has got that what cdo, <laughs> CDO. mine will probably yeah. be on a spreadsheet <laughs> i like spreadsheets so i've got a spreadsheet for it or there's a list for it yeah <laughs> Yeah, but well, for our listeners, that's, you know, good advice as well. It's, you know, just never give up. Yeah, logging your dives, definitely. So, definitely. yeah, yeah. And I'll start mine soon. Yeah, absolutely. we better do the questions, Gemma. Yes, yeah. 
Um, so our first question is, what dive location is on your wish list, bucket list, um, and why? Antarctica. Um, prop, I don't want to go down there for like a couple of days as part of a cruise in Southern America, go down several months, dive it properly under the ice. Uh, and the reason is that the the uh, Antarctic environment, despite cold, is just mm -hmm. created because of its stability. These gigantic um, versions of marine life that we commonly see when we dive off the south coast here. And from a reading point of view, probably the, one of the biggest sections of my own library is early Antarctic and Arctic exploration, the likes of Scott and Amundsen and Shackleton. So uh, to visit the place both for diving and to see the place itself is probably the highest thing on my bucket list. At 51 now, and um, with the financial constraints of that, the, the, the chances are getting slimmer, but you know, uh, one day maybe. maybe. Talk Paul Rose. Uh, Paul is a very good friend of mine. I trained him in Rebreather and I taught him to cave dive. Uh, I worked with him on the Ocean series. I was one of the safety divers and his trainer and Tuni Martu's trainer on the Ocean series for the um, underwater Spelia Firms episode for the, for the uh, filmed on the Balearic. So Paul's a very good friend. Paul was also my primary sponsor for fellowship of the Royal Geographic Society. So he's a, he's a really good friend. Great guy. Absolutely you know, great guy. Yeah. One of the best ambassadors for our sport. He's just so enthusiastic. It's amazing. Yeah. And that was fascinating talking to him. And he's telling us about the polar bear incident when yeah. he was in, in the yeah. tent. And, uh, yeah. But you, you feel the enthusiasm and the motivation. And yeah. he's just like dying to tell you about scuba diving and exploring yeah. Yeah. you know and that, it, that's brilliant you know that you and that's the one the one of the great things about us doing this podcast is that it's allowed us to talk to some really really people like you who did some fascinating stuff who we wouldn't have normally got to speak mm. you know and, and it is brilliant every day we like pinch ourselves we're like wow you know yeah. that was great you know we spoke to someone else on monday uh, uh he was another one and you walk away thinking wow these you know, stuff that these people do brilliant you know yeah it is more, more credit to you guys as well as as well as the personal uh, achievement of that for yourself you've shared it with the community and i think that's been one of the one of the positives to take out of, of COVID lockdown is, I mean, personally, I've done 28 webinars uh, for different groups, all voluntary, because it's like, well, yeah, let's, let's basically give people a reason to stay sane and, and look forward to getting back to it. Um, yeah. and, it and it's down to the organizers, you guys with the Big Scuba podcast, Chantel with the Diver Medic and, and her series of podcasts lots of more regional ones with little local groups that have set things up um, and it, it's it's basically it, it's uh, it's a phenomenal thing that you guys have done all of you that have set up events like this yeah. well, thank you very much very kind yeah. to say so um, yeah. but yeah. We, we, we just really enjoy it and Gemma's going to be starting her journey yeah. well, I'm very lucky to have spoken to all these people and it's kind of really you know inspired me so much more as well and you just think oh I want to do it yeah Absolutely. yeah, yeah. Anyway, right. So another question is, what is your favourite marine animal and why? Yeah, so I think it's it's changed over the years. Um, but I think now, because of one experience I had in um, freshwater spring in Florida, a place called Fanning Spring, I was uh, doing my freediver course and uh, I did it with a couple of friends. And um, the one of the other students on the freediving course was Jill Heinrich. So it was basically uh, Gemma Smith, Jill Heinrich and myself. And we went on the freediving course. And the, the very first day we went to do the basic skills after the dry training and the breathing techniques training. And we went to Fanning Springs because it's not very deep. It's about 10 foot deep at the deepest point. Most of it's about six feet. Uh, and we got in the water and we were in the water for about four hours. And at the end of the day, the instructors were like, well, that was a brilliant day, but a little bit disappointing because we didn't manage to achieve almost any of the skills and the reason for that is when I first got in the water I was just floating on the surface and I felt something like really grab my leg so I looked down and there's basically a manatee and he's got both of his front flippers wrapped around my right leg oh, wow. giving me a hug and it and, and it was in an open spring it wasn't in a place where they are uh, basically held in by fenced areas or anything like that it wasn't in a place where they uh, naturally hang out um, and the tourist trips go to um, mm. because they're trying to stay in warm water. It was way off the beaten track, up one of the rivers in a small, not very frequently visited spring. So that manatee had come into that spring because it wanted, it stayed because it wanted. And when we were trying to do our dynamic apnea, swimming along, 
breath hold. The manatee was swimming with us and it literally <laughs> stayed with the whole time. And I've got video oh, wow. up on my Facebook page and what have you of this manatee just nuzzling, pushing his nose up against my nose through my mask, just nuzzling like this. And it's close up GoPro footage. And this creature was just, I mean, it, it was it was happy to be with us. It was communicating with us in some way, totally ununderstandable to me. Um, so they, prior to that experience, I would have said rays, all types of rays, and I still love rays. But that, that four hours free diving with that manatee made them a particularly magical species to me. Yeah. Um, you, know, you know, they're just, they're just quite, quite unique. So. Yeah. yeah, and they're very yeah, strange looking, aren't they? It's just a, yeah. A, yeah, yeah. prehistoric. Yeah. yeah. Okay, do you, Ian? Okay, so can you give us uh, three people who you would choose to either, if they, if they can't dive, and maybe we can say rock climb, you know, as you, as you like to drive rock climb, climb as well doesn't matter too much so can you give us three people you choose to take either rock climb and dive uh or snorkeling if they can't do either yeah from either history or whenever okay so the first one would be jules verne yeah yeah french french author from the 1800s wrote Twenty Thousand leagues under the sea journey yep. to the center of the earth etc etc and really for me he's the grandfather of steampunk because he invented the nautilus submarine for captain nemo before submarines even existed. And he invented it based on um, uh, natural history drawings of the inside of a Nautilus seashell with its separate air compartments to enable it to be neutral and rise and fall. And he went, right, let's make one of those that men can go in. So he effectively invented the submarine before it existed in a manner where, although what he was writing was fiction, if you look at it now, it is how submarines work. So he was like ahead of his time. Yeah. Um, and he did Journey to the Center of the Earth, which is caving. He, he did um, um, Around the World in a Balloon, which is flying. He did um, 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea, which is a form of diving. And he had diving dress. His crew lived on everything only from the ocean, harvesting, but responsibly, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so if you combine um, the, the storytelling, the steampunk costumes and machines and means of transportation, um, and the environment so I would just love to have met him and uh, so to go for a dive with him on a awesome. trip and, and sit. funnily enough we were we had a copy of, of uh, Journey to the Centre of Earth with us paperback copy in a plastic bag in J2 yeah. um, we, used to, we used to read it to each other at bedtime in the camps underground camps um, which was a bit of fun so I like that that would be my first one um, Jules Verne um, second one uh, would most definitely I think be Shackleton uh, because of the classic historic Victorian explorers I admire him most um, I don't tend to use the hero word I, I tend to um, have people in history I admire for what they did and the way they did it and what I admire most about him was his devotion to his men his leadership um, and that was the most important thing if we do something and something goes wrong we basically do everything in our power to bring everyone home alive and so uh, his, his uh, I've read a lot of his stuff his leadership would be uh, one of those things um, so so yeah that was it how many am I, am I meant to have three was it three, three. three. so I've got one more so uh, I suppose I should try and think of someone who's not dead because so far of both <laughs> from, from history uh, so uh, I think it would have to be Attenborough um, you know and, and obviously at, at his 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 current age in life it would have to be uh, not not too crazy not too too deep or whatever else like that but he is um, the the biggest ambassador of our of all our generations so whether it's like a, a, a 15 year old doing their junior open water or a 50 year old like me now basically running expeditions he, he's been there through all our lives um, showing us what's there and now more recently having the most powerful voice to look what we've done and we need to do something about so I, I think in any capacity whether it be whether it be you know a cup of coffee or uh, a mountain camp or anything uh, he a bit like Antarctica he would be my bucket list of, of people I would like to meet that I've actually potentially yeah. still got he's just he's beyond words really yeah. I agree with all that's brilliant thank you very much um what is your favorite piece of dive kit um so it's, the thing is i dive in so many different environments there is um there is uh um, you have like a favorite hood or something like that very, 
Well, I've, I, I use KO1 hoods, and the reason I use KO1 hoods, and we, I, I'm being very cautious not to turn this question into an advertising campaign, but <laughs> there are a couple of things I must mention because uh, re really I've always chosen kit on functionality. I don't care what color it is. I don't care what it looks like. It, it's basically got a function, especially with what I do now, because most of what I do now is very long, very cold, very deep, and equipment failure it, is, is a serious thing. Mm. The, the reason that the KO1 hoods are so good because they're, they're made of extremely like high quality Japanese neoprene um, custom made to suit your head size and it is just the most comfortable I get a lot of jaw problems broke my jaw when I was young I get none of that jaw pain from being encased in the hood for hours um, and the comfort and warmth is just you know par excellence Five mil. I've got a seven um, because I do a lot, a lot of cold water diving and it's I've literally never been cold in it and so it's a brilliant bit of kit um, I, I have I do have a particular favourite bit of kit but it's a bit odd um, I have a loitakari now a loitakari is a handmade finished rubber suit um, All right. it's a dry hood so the hood seals across the forehead over the cheeks and down under the bottom lip. Um, the inside of the hood is lined with ribbed merino wool. Um, the, there is no neck seal because you've got a dry hood. The, the, finger, the, the hands are three fingered mittens, in my case, with no wrist seals. It's made of very thick, heavy duty um, vulcanized rubber with a cloth lining. And it is quite simply the, the warmest dry suit you can use. It's, it's not for the masses. You wouldn't be able to use it for normal diving. Most of the things we've talked about, like the Tulsa American and the you know, the, the Gribschinden and the Antikythera wreck, completely unsuitable. It's for very mm. cold, very long, um, Baltic and Arctic type conditions. So I use it maybe once a year on my four week trip to the Scandinavian mines. But back to my, my OCD, it's kind of a bit steampunk. It's a bit so odd. So do you, you still inflate like, the same yeah, means? Yeah. Still inflate the same, still dump the same, still got uh, the inlet for heating and what have you. Um, you, you know, you you uh, it, it, it's a specialist piece of equipment for very specialist dives. So it represents maybe 10% of my year I'm using this suit. But I like it in answer to your what's your favourite bit of kit <laughs> because it's odd. You know, so you, what do you, you normally know, dive in if you're not doing anything extreme? Santee. Um, I've been in Santee for over 12 years now. Again, not wanting to turn the answer to this question into a sales pitch, but the guys at Santi um, have been absolutely phenomenal uh, mm -hmm. with me. They custom built to our design suits for the J2 project. They've kept me dry and warm for the last 12 plus years. Um, Thomas, the owner specifically, um, my original suit uh, was still fully functional. It went back last year simply because it looked so old and they've replaced it with a newer version of the same, but there was nothing wrong with it. Mm. Um, the, part, the quality, the functionality, it's just a phenomenal piece of equipment. So, yeah. I don't even <laughs> think of that as, as dive kit. It's just so part of me. It's like, you know, I just put it on and dive. It's, it's such a good yeah. piece of kit. Um, so, uh, yeah, yeah, the, the Loitakari was a bit more of a, kind of left field answer because it's a bit of an odd um, <laughs> yeah. uh, that sits that's in a the bag first one we've had anyway so yeah well, thanks very much for that. it sits in a bag for 11 months of the year comes out gets used for one month of the year where it's absolutely essential then i dust the whole thing down with talc how sure do you get on with your three fingers being joined is that uh, ever an issue i had to teach myself to dive again so bear in mind the sort of dives i'm doing with this suit i'm probably running average five stages a dpv a rebreather so once i got the suit it was like in the local quarry for hours and hours and hours to learn how to rotate and handle multiple stages scooter controls rebreather controls rebreather failure drills but you get used to it pretty quickly yeah. Yeah. the good okay. thing is on deco you can hold this, pull this finger out and put it in with the others. So on the, you can actually have all the fingers together with how you keep them warm. Mittens are so much warmer than gloves because of that region, reason. The fingers yeah, keep them all together. Um, yeah, good idea. So yeah, it's, a, it's a very specialist, very unusual, very rarely used bit of kit, but it's, it's one of my favorites. Yeah, it's good to hear. Good, what it good is. answer. Last question. Um, so, okay, you're a man that's traveled the world and you've been to some of the most remote and extreme places in the world. So, if you've got a chance now, you've got a billboard and you're going to put something on that billboard, it can be an image, it can be a question, it can be a statement, it can be whatever you like, what, what you want to use that billboard for, what are you going to put on it? Wow, that's a tough, that is a tough thing to state. I think, actually, uh, I could probably just summarize it 
and I'd like to point out to the audience that the this you can probably tell by me hesitating to answer this question and some of the other questions like uh, finally coming up with Attenborough they, these questions aren't preloaded I did ask I asked yes. about two weeks ago <laughs> can you send me the questions and uh, and both Gemma and Ian said no and, I, and this is that's made this particular podcast quite special because it does make you think on the feet so now I've had time to think about that I would sum, simplify that down to one word I would put it in bold underlined with a big stripe of highlighter over it and it would simply say explore and each person who reads that can everyone can do to their own capabilities desires um, and those capabilities and desires can expand with time or contract with time but you're never too young or too old and whatever nationality whatever you are you can explore even if it's exploring self so that billboard would simply say i'll tell you why um christina sonata uh, when she came on she taught us three words explore educate and conservation and as yeah. and somebody else actually taught us another one on monday night and that was transform mm. and uh those three words particularly those three words i think uh, well we certainly use them quite a lot now in our podcast uh and i think actually it is for life they're really good and explore is is a, is a brilliant one there's a word that i think good choice of word yeah, yeah. great answers yeah. phil yeah yeah we like that cool yeah so yeah so um i suppose just the final question is like what's your what's your plans for the the rest of the year or the coming year after yeah, okay. um, all all of the current situation we're in permitting um our current plans are a return to phase two of the gribshunden wreck gribshunden is a danish king's um flagship from 1495 um she's in the baltic sea and um, she's absolutely intact because she's in anoxic low saline freezing cold water uh, we worked on her through august september last year for just under a month and recovered some remarkable artifacts ongoing research is taking place with those within the laboratories of lund gothenburg and sotterton universities and we were we were due back on her this year um we're hoping to get out um in september uh, certainly for a survey season if not another excavation season then we'll definitely be back on her next year so that's our biggest ongoing project at the moment. Looking forward to that. We've already discussed the B-17. Very keen to get back on that um, and hopefully to recover another fallen war hero and send him home to his family um, very much. Um, uh, and then basically um, we have other similar uh, aircraft wreck projects, um, some of which in Scandinavia now, to do the same job on, which is basically going to be moving into next year. Um, and for me, um, caves. Basically, if you give me a day off... <laughs> I want to be in a hole in the ground. So um, <laughs> anywhere I can find a hole in the ground, that's that's where you'll find me. You should so. be on Lord of the Rings. <laughs> well, one of my nicknames has been Gollum or Smeagol over the years. Uh, <laughs> passing resemblance, no hair, big ears, big gold goggly eyes, and, and a, a, you know, a, a preference Brilliant. on the ground, and I like fish. So, you know, it is what it is. So if for people who uh, are now listening to us and they're listening to you for the first time and they want to keep up to date with what you're up to, where are they best to go to to keep up to date with what you're up to and where are Probably you on the, social media? Uh, most up to date, Facebook page phil short technical um, my company's facebook page is dark water exploration so mostly the commercial projects go on the dark water page my daily diving and caving life goes on the phil short technical page um, the instagram version of that is phil short explorer um, and my website is darkwaterexploration.com but uh, i think the most the most used and the most up-to-date of just everything is the phil short technical facebook um, that's great okay, thank you very much Excellent. yeah that's been really good phil it's just yeah it's very inspiring talk again yes well seriously for you have have a fabulous time um uh, enjoy uh, your first dives um you know uh, and hopefully i really hope you get out to the sea on the sunday because you'll be you'll you'll be fine if you have to do the first the first both days in a quarry never mind but uh, just just uh, you know you can find the magic in every dive and for yeah. me that first yeah. day in Stone cove it was stony cove in february in a wetsuit that didn't fit and it was a wetsuit not a semi-dry and i i went down to that aircraft cockpit and saw a perch swim past me and i was like wow 
It's a dish. <laughs> so if, you can find a bit of magic in every dive. So really enjoy it, um, and, and 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 I hope it's fabulous and stick at it. Yeah, we'll we'll be right. posting about it on social media. But yeah, and your advice, perfect. Yeah, sure. You've been brilliant, Phil. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Take care, guys. I look forward to seeing uh, the podcast once you launch it. But take yeah, care. Yeah, brilliant. We'll Thank keep you in time. Okay. Bye Thanks, Phil. Sugar's coated, dreams don't start to shatter. Hello, we're back. What do you think of that? I hope you enjoyed it. Yeah, Phil Short, he was really good, wasn't he? Of course, yeah, yeah, yeah really, really interesting, enjoyed that. Interesting guy. Hope, hope you did as well. Yeah, yeah, and we've got so much more coming up in the future episodes. Yeah, yeah, we have. Yeah, we've got uh, a lot more guests all, all lined up. And, um, you know, so uh, do keep keep tuned, keep subscribing, keep sharing, tell your friends, you know, get them listening. So we can't do this without your support. So uh, please do. And hello to you patrons out there. So thank you very much. Yeah, and subscribers, YouTube subscribers. Yeah. But before we go, who have we got next? Um, who have we got next? I can't who remember. Next? Who have we got next? What oh yes. <laughs> well, since as he's been doing loads of press ups lately, I thought we could sh we should really in the th theme of uh, what you've been doing, Tech Clark, is have you up next, <laughs> Tech? You're up next. <laughs> From a million